Yesterday, the Manchester Derby, United getting up over City 2-1. So that lead, precious for Arsenal, almost at the halfway stage of the season. Most teams, 18 games. The odd team, 19 games. Tom Rooney from TalkSport rejoins us on the platform. Happy New Year, Tom. Happy New Year. Welcome back to work, you lazy bastard. <laughs> I tell you what, the man who takes the most holidays and the longest holidays. Actually, no, I tell you what, there'd be some politicians up your gaff, wouldn't there, that would take, what, months and months off? Yeah, just me and Boris Johnson, that's it. That's it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, I mean, we've got so much football to talk about, uh, and might as well kick it off because you were at uh, Spurs watching Arsenal. Well, I mean, I was going to say reclaim the top spot, but what I actually mean is that reassert themselves with an eight-point lead. We've been talking about this all season, mate. They are the real deal, aren't they? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, I I can see why people doubt Arsenal. I understand why they doubt Arsenal. I I didn't think Arsenal were going to win the league at the start of the season, but, you know, I went to see them against Newcastle, what, last week, midweek, and and saw them again today in the North London Derby. Big tests against big opponents, and... There's so many players playing so well. The organisation is tremendous. The fight is unbelievable. Granite Xhaka wants to have a punch-up with everybody else, but he's doing everything but have a punch-up because he's also become one of the Premier League's best number eights. You've got Eddie Nketiah making it seem like Gabriel Jesus wasn't even a necessary signing. Gabriel Martinelli frightening the life out of fullbacks like Pete Ryan Giggs. Um, Bakayo Saka is so delicate and intricate and he's playing the penalty area but also lethal on the break uh, and Martin Erdegaard I mean this guy when he came in and went to Arsenal it was because his career had not hit the skids but it hadn't hit the heights that we all thought when he went to Real Madrid when he was in 17 or whatever and he had that good run at was it Sociedad and we heard some good things but we weren't expecting much we were expecting um, you know a mid-level La Liga player to come over and maybe come off the bench for Arsenal a bit as Emil Smith-Rowe became their number 10, right? That was broadly what we thought at the time. And the way he plays, and the way he's played this season, the back end of last season, the way he leads the team as well, by example, and very vocal on the field. Um, sensational footballer, like a real world-class player. And if Arsenal have a world-class player in the centre of their midfield, they have two incredibly solid players in Partey and Xhaka behind him. The defence looks like, looks like it's unbeatable. Aaron Ramsdale made save after save after save after save. Um, the only thing that actually hit him today was a Spurs fan's boots uh, that wasn't intentional. Beyond that, he, he intentionally got in the way of everything Spurs threw at him, which wasn't much, to be fair. And yeah, I, I mean, look, what, are they eight points clear mm. at this moment mm. in time? I, I think that the Newcastle look good and Man United look good. And of course, City will come back. But are they going to drop eight points? I don't know. Half a season, that's two defeats and two draws. And at the moment, I think that's a stretch. Tom Rooney talks sport. You see, I still have a theory, mate. I mean, we're not even halfway through, okay? We're just about 18 games, 19 games for some teams, okay? So ask me, I always say after 28 games, whoever wins the title has to string together a run now of eight, nine, 10 wins in 11 or 12 games. You know what I'm talking about. Over the last five seasons, there's only been two teams. Liverpool did it once, but Man City are the only team that's been capable consistently consistently of winning 11, 10, 12 games in a row, and that's what wins you the title. I still think that they're that team. Yeah, we are a bit skewed. You are right to say that, because usually at 19 games, that's Boxing Day. Yeah. And, of course, we're, we're late into, into January now. So we're about two or three weeks later than we usually are. But I, I, I can't see Arsenal losing, right? I can't see Arsenal losing. I could see them potentially dropping some points and maybe drawing some games in the worst-case scenario. But I can't see, unless there's a massive glut of injuries, which we've spoken about loads with Arsenal, if we lose the first team, is there a second string to come in? There is not quality backups in each position. Yeah. But then we said that about Leicester when they won the title. We said it uh, when Liverpool won the title. We've said it loads of times. Teams at times in history have got their 11 mainly fit all season long and have gone on to win trophies and titles. So it can be done. And I agree with what you say about Manchester City. But I mean, we'll we'll talk about the Manchester Derby in a minute. But their performances over the last month since we came back and at the back end before the World Cup as well, confusing, underwhelming. That there's players that are off form for the first time in years. Bernardo Silva and Phil Foden and even Jack Grealish, who scored at the weekend, doesn't look anywhere near the player we, we thought that was going to City for £100 million. So I can see it because they've done it repeatedly. But currently, we're in the worst form that Man City have been in under Pep Guardiola, probably since his first season where they scraped into the Champions League on the final day. So 
I, I think Arsenal at this point are massive favourites for the title. I can actually see all the teams below them going on unbeaten runs. I don't know about win after win after win, but unbeaten runs. But again, the eight-point gap, that requires them to lose to Man City in February, a possibility, and then somebody else has got to beat them, and then the others have got to get a bunch of points. We're only at the halfway stage, I know, but I just can't see Arsenal currently losing that many games. But they still might need to buy a couple of players in January to cover the issues if they come up. But they better buy those players without letting anyone know first, because if they do... Chelsea will swoop in and buy them instead. Uh, let's talk about the Man United Man City game in just a second, because I know that you you will be one of the very few people on the planet. They will agree with me that of course Marcus Rashford wasn't interfering with play, and that was a perfectly valid goal. <laughs> so, but Liverpool, when when Jurgen Klopp says that that's the worst that they've ever played under him, they played eighteen games. They've lost what am I looking at? They've lost six of those games. They're, they're way off the top four places. Uh, their squad looks tired. They look leg weary. They need a midfield. Their strikers aren't. Squ- I mean, where do they go from here? Do they still have a season left in them? Can can he resurrect it? Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's got so many shades of of Jurgen Klopp's final season at Borussia Dortmund. I don't think he gets a better job than this in football. So I don't think he would walk away. Um, and it doesn't seem like there's a great deal of cash to spend at Liverpool as well, which is quite interesting. With the owners seemingly trying to sell up trying to find a sovereign wealth or a public investment fund or a leveraged American to take over from the current leveraged Americans. I mean, but the the problems are clear. The problems are clear and they're going to need long-term strategic planning for the next phase of what Liverpool are. And whether it's under Klopp or not, I think that's actually up in the air for the first time in the best part of a decade. The midfield needs upgrades. It needs one or two players. That's evident. Um, the, The players that they've relied on for a long time, the legs have maybe gone a little bit. The confidence has gone a little bit. The players around them aren't as good as the players they once had, and the, the the ongoing injury crises as well. I mean, Darwin Nunes now out, Luis Diaz is out, uh, Virgil van Dijk is out. I mean, it, it goes on and on and on. The same issues week in, week out. They can't get a run together. And the best Jurgen Klopp teams, everyone listening knows this, the best Klopp teams, we could all just name them. We could name who was going to play here and there and where and why and how and how you stop them was the big question. And it couldn't be done for a, for a period of time. At the moment, I have no idea what formation they're going to play. I've no idea who's going to play up front, defence. Everything at the moment with Liverpool is up in the air. And that is not how Klopp teams run. They run on consistency. And currently, you don't have it. So, you know, I, I think Klopp is still the right man to do it. He needs money to change things around. And there's a few players that have got to be shifted on. But what you notice in football now as you see with, with Todd Bowley at the moment at Chelsea, it's easy to buy players. It's getting players off the wage bill to make the room to buy players, which is the biggest problem for Premier League clubs. And that's what Liverpool are going to have. There's a lot of contracts they're going to need to let run down before they can bring other players in. Tom Rooney talks, sport. Arsenal beating Spurs this morning, so they're top of the table. Man City tucked in behind Newcastle, Man United, the other top four. But let's look way down, way down this end down here, Tom. I'm not mm. quite there. I've still got to tunnel my way through to the core of the centre of the earth to find your beloved West Ham, a brand new year full of excitement, full of hope. Oh, you must be just so effed off with this team and this coach at the moment. Are you going to survive? Why do I come on this show? I was in a good mood before <laughs> this interview. Why, why, why How could you be this? in a good mood? You get, play rubbish all year. Your manager's a joke, mate. Well, the trouble is, is that he's not a joke. And that's why it's frustrating, because David Moyes has delivered two of the best seasons that West Ham have had in my lifetime. It, it, they really have been tremendous for, for two and a half years. But this year, this season has been diabolical. Um, it's 15 away games without victory, just two points in 15 away games. It's one point in eight Premier League games. It's four wins all season. It's awful stats. In the last year, they've beaten nobody... Um, currently in the Premier League's top half, apart from Fulham, who are currently in the top half. And in the nine wins they've got in the calendar, uh, the last 38 games, forgive me, two of them were against Norwich. So they, they can't find a way to win games. And the trouble is, the, the best David Moyes team, a bit like Jurgen Klopp, you knew the 11, and the 11 were delivering, and he made no substitutions, and they kept on delivering. In the summer, they were the third biggest net spenders in the Premier League. He's got no idea how to get a tune out of Lucas Paqueta. He's got no idea what to do with Gianluca Scamacca. He's not had Nea Figuera all season. Those were the three big marquee signings. And the old reliable, Jared Bowen's been garbage. He doesn't play Ben Rama, who's the second top scorer for some reason. 
Declan Rice has been doing too much. He's not doing what he's good at because he's trying to be an everyman. He's trying to be Brian Robson when he's in Golo Conte. Uh, and that's not quite working. Thomas Socek with the team he's built around. You know, he, he can't win a flick on. So what's he doing there? He doesn't score goals. So what's he doing there? And David Moyes doesn't know how to fix it. And it, it, it's sad. I really don't want David Moyes to go because the, the, the respect I have for him for what he has done is, is massive. But I think he's out to lunch. I, I think if you look here at his post-match interview after Wolverhampton Wanderers, the loss at the weekend, which I predicted seven hours in advance, by the way, um, minute by minute, I predicted what was going to happen. Luckily, you're, you're OK. I did bet on it. Um, so I made some money there. That was at least one positive. But you gave the post-match interview and he's just bewildered. We've all seen this with managers and we've all seen it in all different industries and walks of life. So, someone, he's just bewildered. Everything he's doing is not working out. All the old tricks aren't working. His new tactics aren't working. The old players aren't working. The new players aren't working. A David Moyes team who doesn't score from corners at this moment in time. It's all gone wrong. He should have gone. He should have gone after Brentford. He should have gone after Leeds. He should have gone after the game this weekend. Whatever happens against Everton this coming weekend, he should go and they should find a replacement. But West Ham aren't exactly the best at forward planning. They're in a relegation battle where they should be nowhere near it. And to give a bit of colour to that, I did the Bournemouth-Brentford game at the weekend. Bournemouth have two blokes called Ben Pearson, who spent most of his time at Preston North End, and a guy, a guy called uh, Joe Rothwell, who I'd literally never heard of until Saturday morning. And they're above West Ham in the table, who have got Declan Rice and Lucas Paqueta in midfield. The only way that happens is bad management. He's got to go. Tom, finally, as I said, and you'll be right alongside me here, the referee mm. was very clear. He was in the right spot. Marcus, look, if United had conceded that goal, I'd be absolutely livid. He called it and said that he wasn't interfering with play. Was he interfering with play? Was he interfering with play? The ball was played to him. Like, it's insanity that that goal was given. Because, I mean, look, let's go with the laws of the game, right? You're offside if a player moving from or standing in an offside position is in the way of an opponent and interferes with the movement of the opponent towards the ball. That is an offside offence. All of that, for me, happened. Another part of it, if you make an obvious action which clearly impacts the ability of an opponent to play the ball, you're offside. That happened. The ball is played to him because it is played to him. Akanji runs one way. Edison runs out to him and Kyle Walker's on the cover trying to catch Bruno Fernandes. If Rashford isn't there, Akanji clears it. If Rashford isn't there, Edison doesn't come out to close the ball down. It's so bonkers to me that that was given. It, it's, it's, it's ridiculous that it was given. He is clearly offside. He is clearly interfering. He runs after the ball, blocks off the defender chasing it from his right shoulder and then sort of shimmies on the ball because he then realises, oh, Bruno's in here. I could leave this. He is so active at that moment in time. Uh, I, I can't believe that they would consider that not to be interfering with play. The ball was literally played to him and he ran onto it. You don't have to touch the ball to interfere with play. And if we just look at the game between Wolves and Liverpool last week, Wolves got a legitimate winner in that game. It was given offside because someone behind the play was offside in the build-up to the goal and was the initial target of the cross. Literally last week, the opposite thing uh, proved to be the case, right? There's no scenario. There's just no scenario where that should be given as a goal. It's utterly ridiculous that they decided immediately that it should be given. I think the players on the field did pressure the referee. I think the referee got overwhelmed by what was happening. And I think even in Stockley Park, they got overwhelmed by what was happening. Their interpretation of the laws of football was utterly wrong against the letter and spirit of what the laws of the game are supposed to be. It was disgraceful. And the frustrating thing, not for, not for you, you won the game, right? But Man United were brilliant, absolutely brilliant in that game of football. And I think they would have got back into that game without that shambles of a goal. Not that Man United fans need to care about it, but to see something like that happen, and you know I don't care who wins the league, as long as the team who won it last year doesn't win it, I'm pretty much all right. I don't care about these two teams, so I don't need to get annoyed about it. But for all of us, for football fans, goals like that shouldn't exist. And, and that's my issue. 
Awesome. Excellent, mate. That fucking brilliant. See, I don't know what game you're watching. And just to, just to clarify for people as well, <laughs> is that um, because the referee, it's a subjective decision, and he was placed and he thought there wasn't interfering with play, then VAR can't come in because no offence was actually committed. We've got to make that... Being offside is not an offence. It doesn't yeah. stop play. So because of that, VAR can't interfere and say, hang on a second, no, 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 our subjective decision is actually better than your subjective decision because the thing was a subjective decision. Is it subjective? So the ref saw it. He was in the place. He decided it wasn't a deference, so he can call it. That's just to let people know why VAR didn't step in. Yeah, exactly right. Offside, as they have it, is a black or white decision. And if they decided that he wasn't a firm with play, then it's an obvious white decision that he's going to be offside. The referee on field at that moment, along with the assistant referee, pressured by Bruno Fernandes and 70,000 in Old Trafford, they're the ones who decided Rashford was not interfering with play. And that is insanity.